how much you owe. Yeah. And <laughs> written note. Sure. Or physically. Oh, hi. Energy, energy, energy. That creates the lid. Everybody so if you and I them. disagree on something, then you must be erased and banished from life. So how does I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit here and drink this water. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's Sam Speaks and Sam Speaks Radio on iTunes. We're excited today to have Joe Rand. He is the Chief Creative Officer at Better Homes and Gardens Rand Realty. Hi, Joe. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So we kind of talked before the show about your background, which is very unique. Let's talk about that. Uh, well, I, I was a lawyer for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, after I graduated law school, worked for a big law firm, hated it, uh, always wanted to teach. So I went and got a fellowship uh, at Stanford University uh, and then taught for about four or five years until uh, my family's had a real estate company for 30 years. My brothers were having a blast with it. I was not really enjoying the writing part of academia. Academia, I love the, the, te the teaching and the speaking and all that. Right. I didn't like the writing articles no one was ever gonna read. Uh, and so they pulled me in uh, right. to the real estate company back about 15 years ago uh, to run legal, to run training, education, things like that. And I've had a wonderful time since then. Right, it's, it's interesting because, you know, like we spoke uh, earlier, I also was had a teaching background. I was a adjunct professor at a university as well, and I was in the hospitality program. And mm. I know you have said that you've had a good amount of people come from that background. What can you say as far as how hospitality plays into the real estate world? I think hospitality is amazing training for real estate because you learn how to read people. Um, it's a service profession, mm -hmm. so you, you're really trying to take care of people, and I think that's really an important lesson. I think people that they manage hotels or they manage restaurants or nightclubs or things like that, they, they learn how to treat people, and they realize that you can be of service to people without being subordinate or being subservient. But right. that doesn't mean that. I mean, when you're being of service means that you're taking care of them, and taking right. care of somebody is an awesome responsibility that if you know how to do it well, you can be really good at this business. Right, and problem solving. Problem solving, taking care of things. I mean, um, there's a, one of the books that I always have people read um, uh, is the Danny Myers Setting the Table, uh, who runs the Union Square ho uh, Hospitality Group in Manhattan. Uh, and he writes about all these wonderful stories about how they put all these rules in place and protocols about how to take care of people. And I've learned from that because in my teaching, I try to teach people how to be good at real estate. And one of the ways I try to do that is set these rules up. You know, the rule that if, you know, in a restaurant, if somebody says they didn't like the meal and they want to send it back, even if they've eaten half of it, or even if they've eaten all of it, mm -hmm. you, you don't say anything, absolutely, we'll take it back, we'll take it off the bill. Because that's a rule that you just put in place that you follow every time. And if you do, you're gonna create good experiences. And we're in the business of providing really good experiences to people. And you have to manufacture that in some way. You have to set yourself up with a plan to let that be the result. How should a buyer's agent give that buyer a great experience. Let's let's say someone's a new agent. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, well, I want to set myself apart. I want to be different. What can they offer to show that they're different since they don't have experience? You mean right from the bat? Right from the bat. I always find that the best way to make a great impression on somebody the first time you meet them um, is to provide them with information even before you walk in the door. Like one of the things we teach our agents to do is send what we call an orientation package. Mm -hmm. That before you're meeting, let's say you're meeting someone tomorrow night at six o'clock, either a buyer or a seller taking them out, that send them either a package of material in the mail or drop it off or a set of links in an email or something customized to them that tells them who you are. That mm -hmm. so many times agents go in to meet with a client and they just push a massive amount of material on the on the table that the client has to read. You know, right. if it's a graph or it's a picture and the person can look at it, well then it's fine. Right. But if it's like a testimonial, how is the person supposed to read the testimonial while you're talking to them? Right. Send them that stuff in advance. You know, and if you're new, you know, you don't have like past clients, but you have people you've worked with. You have letters of reference from people that that you worked in other industries with. Have them write letters for you and use those letters as your means of introduction. And as soon as you do have clients, even if it's someone that hasn't bought a house with you yet, you've just taken them out. Say, listen, I love if you could write a letter about the experience you've had with me. Start to build those up so you build up your repertoire of things that you can provide to a client. Right. Because you want to make that impression and it's very tough very, you know, you're making promises. The first time you meet with somebody, you're making promises. So what can you do to substantiate those? Right. Well, if you've already demonstrated to them that before you even met them, 
you were giving them service by explaining the process. You sent them materials about what they can expect from meeting with you, what can they can expect from the first time you go out, what they can expect from the process of buying a home. Here's a list of all the homes we're gonna buy. I see agents showing up for their buyer appointment to take somebody out. And they've got a bunch of crappy looking MLS sheets that they printed up of the properties they're gonna show. Mm -hmm. As opposed to spending, we have, the, we have the tools at our company, I'm sure that you do at your company, most companies have really nice tools to print up, really beautiful materials to show to a client, say these are the properties we're gonna to see today, rather than a bunch of MLS sheets that are really the client version of the agent sheet, which look terrible. Right. Um, and they don't do that. And that, and that to me, you wanna make that effort to make that impression on somebody. Right, it's interesting too, because I find that some agents will also make that first meeting or introduction at the property. Yeah. And it kills me it's because you don't even know what they look like and you're like, oh hey, are you are you my client? I mean <laughs> It's it's a terrible it's idea crazy. because one, it's dangerous. Right. You know, I mean you should never meet somebody at a property. You should meet them in a neutral place, either your office or you can meet them in a coffee shop or someplace right. where people are gonna see you because that, you know, just as a safety precaution. But also, it's not professional. Mm -hmm. It's not professional. I understand that someone calls you and you're a new agent and you know leads are precious and someone calls you and they say, well, you know, I really don't have time to go meet with you before and can we just meet at the property at three o'clock? And it's so easy to say yes and just to give in. But you mm -hmm. have to say, if I can meet you at three because if I'm supposed to be able to provide you with an experience, I'm supposed to take care of your buying experience. I'm supposed to represent you. Right. I have a fiduciary responsibility to you. I cannot do that if I meet you at the property. I need to sit down with you, even if it's just for 10 minutes. Let's meet at this nearby coffee shop, So, because there's always disclosures that have to be signed and things that have to be artic you know, done and, and conveyed. Um, and let's do that and let's talk for a few minutes before we go see this property. And let me find out a little bit about you right now because maybe there's some other properties that you don't know about that I might be able to show you that are in the neighborhood to give you a context for that property. Right. Meeting at the property is like literally one of the things I hate most about this business. And I try to tell give, agents all the time. Yeah, and it will give that sense of respect as for you as an agent, which again, let's say you only show that one property, you have the lead and they're like, I wanna just see this property at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. If you just do that and you don't build that relationship from the start, they might just see that one property and it might be one and done Done, but not done with a deal, done with done they with didn't a, like it they and they like just it. work with the next Well, they're not person. working with you yet. You're just chauffeuring them. You're a door opener. You're not right. actually working with them if you just take them into a property. You have to actually you know, be able to put that in the context of other properties. Nobody can see one property and have any idea whether it's a good value. You need to see what else is in the neighborhood. That's what I always explain to people. Like, let's go see a couple and let's talk a little bit about what you're looking for. That's, that's providing service to people. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't want it, you have to do it because that's your job. Right. And and if you can't persuade somebody to spend 10 minutes to meet you before they go look at the property, what are you wasting your time for? Right. That, if that person's not willing to make that small commitment to you, you're probably not gonna have a great experience working with them. And right. the time that you save going on those one-off appointments is time that you could spend building relationships that could lead to much more uh, beneficial uh, deals down the line. Right, let's talk about social media. So. You know, you said before, before you're meeting with a buyer or seller, you should send this package, yeah. which also showcases your level of expertise, how you do things in a very professional way. Yeah. But then, you know, I know personally, I see, you know, the, the perfect presentations, and then I go on someone's Facebook or Instagram, and the pictures that they put up of themselves are beyond unprofessional, yeah. and it's like, it's like you're, you've met two different people. So what would you say to you know today's agents with how they should, how they portray themselves and what should they be putting out on their social media? Um, I, yeah, this is a big problem I think for people because they don't realize how easy it is to do research on them. Um, and I always tell people when you're gonna meet with a client, you should absolutely Google them. Of course. Look them up on Facebook, you know, do all your research on them because you never know whether you find out what you find out about right. them or whether you find out they have mutual friends, which right. you can then use, hey, I, I just saw that you're friends with this person and that helps you build some, um, some uh, credibility with them yeah. in repertoire. Um, when it comes to your own social media, you know, you just, you have to recognize that anything you put up there could be seen by someone you're gonna be interviewing for a job with, someone you're gonna be interviewing as a, as a, you know, to take their listing, to take them as a buyer, that they could look you up. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. I, I always say to people, you can use Facebook for your personal life or you can use your Facebook for your business. Mm -hmm. 
but if you do it for both, then it's going to be sort of this hodgepodge where you can do as personal stuff as you want, posting pictures of your kids, anything positive you want to post, you know, fun pictures, nice pictures, but nothing racy or, or you know, that could be perceived as offensive. Right. Um, and also, you don't want to be so far overboard on the, per on the professional side that all your friends are like rolling their eyes like, oh, another listing she took, she's <laughs> posting. Like that gets really annoying fast yeah. the same way. Um, I tell people sometimes you bifurcate that and create, you know, you can set your, you know, Facebook's very tough to really set it very privately, mm -hmm. but Instagram's easier. So just, if you want to do like post the pictures of you doing cake stands or whatever, <laughs> post them on Instagram and keep it private to right. just your friends so nobody else can see it. And on your, on your Facebook side, you know, keep it more professional. I actually, I mean, this is something that most people don't do. I have two Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. I have the Facebook page I use for business, and I have a Facebook page. It's really just for a group of friends that I have from college. Mm -hmm. We're all horrible people, and when I mix them together, <laughs> they were posting all sorts of terrible pictures from college and embarrassing me in front of my business associates. So I was like, That's let me second get them out. You, you don't I, let them tag you. <laughs> yeah, I know, but like, you know what it's like. They, they're, they're relentless. So I put, them, I put them separately, and that's where like I'm a little bit more, you know, close friends that I can let myself, but even then I don't go crazy. It's right. still findable. Um, you just gotta be careful which because anyone up, can look that up. Right, but which brings up a good point. Just because you have a business page and a personal page doesn't mean that people can't see your personal no, page. No, you got, you got, listen, it's like anything else. Anything you put out there, just assume that someone's gonna find it. So unless you're, it's the same thing like with email. Like I'm really careful now with email because mm -hmm. you see these emails, people's emails getting exposed publicly you know, there were a long time ago you'd see people send emails and they would send a joke in it. And the joke would be like something really outrageous they would say that he and I would know is right. a joke. That he's saying this kind of lampooning that kind of attitude. But I don't even do that kind of stuff anymore because I always assume any email I send could be seen by, you know, somebody somewhere down the line. And I don't want to ever put anything on paper that could make me look bad or would be offensive to somebody else. That's the attorney in you. That's the attorney in me. It's also that <laughs> I, I just, I once wrote an email to my assistant saying, this agent is being a real pain, could you take care of this? And yeah. my assistant then forwarded the email to oh, the agent geez. to say, um, you know, Joe asked me to look into this, what's the problem? And I looked at, did you read the email chain that I sent to you? So I, of course I had a lot of problems with that agent I had to deal yeah. with. So that's why, that literally taught me, never put anything in an email that Right. would be problematic like that. Just be very, you know, to the point about things. Right. What do you think, it, this actually kind of correlates, um, what do you think about these Facebook groups that are out there? I mean, some of them have tens of thousands of agents, and there's a lot of positive information, but then there's a lot of agents complaining about clients or putting things in a negative light, which again, you know, if you're on there, your competitor might be on there too, and you know it's a very small world there's a lot of people in this world but it's a very small world so that is all in writing how do you feel i guess from the attorney in you and from it doesn't have to be the attorney yeah here's the thing but also from a real estate perspective those kind of groups are terrific insofar as they involve people running them who are cultivating them mm -hmm. um, who are curating them i should say they're curating their, their content, they're managing it. And some people do a better job of this than others, that they have a point of view they're trying to express. People that then post, I have a question about this, I'm having an issue, does anybody have any suggestions? My only concern about that is that you end up in lots of situations where people will give their opinion. You don't know who that person is. Right. Why, who is that person to give an opinion? They're in a different state. If there's any legal issues involved, they have different structure of the way their deals work. I mean, you can't really, it's, it's just the worst way to get advice right. on, on deal type stuff. If you want to post something on one of these sites where you say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about doing Facebook advertising, who's had good experiences with it? Great thing to do, people share their experiences, those are as valid as anybody else's, and you might get some expert insight from the people that run, this, run the, the group. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. I think they're wonderful for that reason. I think people venting and like, I just don't understand that. I don't understand why you would spend time doing that. Right. I mean, I don't, people understand the idea, the, the old idea of like wasting time in the office is going to get a cup of coffee and sitting there with like 10 other agents and they're just bitching about the market, about your clients, and then you, you waste a half hour doing that. Everybody understands that's like the a waste of a half hour. It is no different than if you sit down and type out a message for 10 minutes and then spend an hour reading all the responses right. of people. Why are they, do, I don't understand how people have this much time to be typing out like responses to someone they've never met. I, I, I just never engage in that. I, I will be, you know, if everyone, anyone asks me a question, 
I will always answer their question right. if they direct it to me. If someone tweets me, if someone posts something on my Facebook business page, if someone you know, sends me an email, I always answer it. But, you know, I respect the fact that someone has come to me for my opinion. But I don't understand, like I would never jump in, dive into a random conversation, except in the very rarest of, of circumstances where I see there's like an interesting industry issue that I wanna make an opinion on. But like, you know, I have a problem with a client, I'm really annoyed at him, oh, I have terrible clients too. Like who does that and how is that helpful or constructive to anybody? Well, which leads me to another interesting question. You would think that, you know, these pages that have tens of thousands of agents, that they, why aren't they asking their broker? Why aren't they talking to their company? Yeah. What is wrong? Not necessarily what's wrong, but what do you think has changed with um, today's real estate brokerage as to why agents are now resorting to Facebook groups to ask certain questions than their own broker? I think that part of it is quite honestly that in the last 20 years, we've seen a change in how the commission dollar is apportioned. Mm -hmm. So whereas the, the broker might have been getting, say, 35 cents on the dollar 20 years ago, it might be more like 18 cents now or mm -hmm. 20 cents now. And quite honestly, brokers, you know, what they've done in order to be able to survive in an environment where there are dramatically higher agent splits is they've cut back on stuff. Right. They've cut back on training. They've cut back on support. They've cut back on... You know, there used to be people in the office whose job it was to handle and manage your deals. And maybe that person is now covering, instead of covering 30 agents in an office, they're covering 300 agents in a company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there used to be in-house training with a full-time trainer. Maybe now there isn't. Um, to, and that other person that you can go to. Maybe you had a manager. Now you, you have a manager, but the manager's a producer, and they're doing 40 deals a year. So how much time do they have to deal with your little problem? Right. Um, so that may be part of it. I mean, I, or else it might just be the fact that, like I said before, the kinds of conversations that used to take place, agents talking to other agents and bitching to other agents that used to take place in the coffee room are now taking place on Facebook groups. Right. It may just be that that conversation has moved to the internet and to the cloud and now there's so many more people to talk to. I just find it to be a giant time sucker. Right. I really try to manage my social media time. To I do it on the odd. I do it while I'm in Starbucks getting coffee. I do it. I do it at red lights. You know, I do it like when I can fit in the time. Not while you're driving. Not while I'm driving. At red lights. Red <laughs> lights when I'm stopped. Um, that, you know, I do it at the, the quick moments of the day be, or you know, like early in the morning when I'm lying in bed trying to wake myself up. That's when I check some of these sites mm -hmm. because I want to keep abreast of what's going on, but like I don't want it to interfere with my day because you can get caught up in one of these threads and look up and it's an hour and a half and you got nothing done. Like right. there's no, and even like, you know, You've not even created a record because nobody ever goes back over those sites right. and looks back at the discussions from six months ago. That's actually one of the other things that's really annoying about them, um, all of them, it was no, and picking out nobody in particular, is that it's the same conversation over and over again. If you right. watch it for long enough, nobody's looking, nobody's sort of cataloging. There's no wiki that sort of puts all the things in order that you can find. You know, did anybody ever ask this? Is anyone? No, this has been asked before. Like a million times this has been asked before. But And the same people just render the same opinions. Right. So it, it really just a time suck. Right. So with the changing real estate brokerage, what are three questions, important questions, top questions, that agents should ask when they're deciding who they, they should hang their license with? Um, you know, I think the three things that you want to know about, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't frame the necessary as questions, but the three things you want to inquire about. Um, obviously, and I respect the fact that people, well, the first thing they go into, so I'm not even going to say, what's the commission split? Now, what's right. what's Which the arrangement on the financial? But I think that's fair. I mean, you go to a job interview, you want to know what the salary is. Uh, and even though I think it, you know, I think too many people go into it and it's the only thing they're concerned about. Right. I think it's got to be one of the things you want to know. Show me the commission schedule and how it works. Mm -hmm. And not only the commission, what's the fee schedule? Like, what's the, if I were to do $100,000 of gross commission income, how would, how does that lay out, Right. right. That's one. I think the second thing you want to know about is I think you want to know about what is the support and training that the, the company offers. Mm -hmm. um, so and you don't have to go to these. Facebook so you don't programs. have to. Well, so you don't have to go to. So, you, so I mean, you know, so new agents particularly reason. need that. Like a lot of companies, most of the training is online, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, there's mm -hmm. good training online. There's bad training online. Being online doesn't mean anything other than the fact that there's you know you're leveraging time into um, you're getting economies of scale from it. But then you should really, if they're gonna do that, say, well, can I see a couple of the modules? Can I see, a, can I watch a little bit of it to see whether it's good or whether it's just, they put up a PowerPoint with a voiceover and you know, it's four hours of, you know, your head's hitting the ground because it's so right. boring, you don't learn anything. 
or you know, is it stuff that they're basically regurgitating, you know, 50 year old scripts and just saying, hey, this is our training program and it's stuff that they used to sell vacuum cleaners back in the 20s, not anything that relates to the modern consumer. And I think the third thing is, I have a deal problem, who do I go to? Mm -hmm. What's the, I, I think you want, you want to know what's the daily routine going to be? What, what, if I have a problem, who am I going to? What's my line of, you know, that I go for problems or for issues or things like that? I how will say, available are <coughs> who's going to be, who's, who's managing me? Right. You know, and are they, man how many people are they managing and how are they also running a business on their own? Right. Um, you know, I think those are, you know, so there's so many things you want to know, but I will say this, one of the mistakes that people make, I think, is, you know, I have people all the time who say to me, you know, should I go work at, from outside, outside my area, they'll say, I'm in Phoenix and there's these two or three companies and one of them is Century 21 or one of them is a call a bank or one of them is, and I say, you know, the brand, whether it's a franchise or kind of a national, you know, a big multi-state multi, multi -state company, whatever, means much less than the person who's actually in that office. Mm -hmm. Like your experience, you know, we have a Better Homes and Gardens franchise um, and we operate that franchise and they're a great partner for us. But I couldn't necessarily say that a Better Homes and Gardens franchise in an area of the country and I don't know that operator and I don't know that that I could say, oh, you should go work for that person over the Keller Williams or the Remax or the Cola Banker or the Independent or whoever down the block, mm -hmm. because it's all about the operator. Right. It's all about the operator. It's all about the manager. That's the most important thing. The, the 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 every company has tools. Every company has brand. Every company has. It's how that gets implemented by the operator himself. It's or herself. It's the same as you know. For example, McDonald's mm -hmm. is a franchise. McDonald's, as a franchise, has much more top-down control over the experience that a consumer has. I mean, people don't run a McDonald's franchise and decide how the burgers are supposed to be tossed. They show them. This is the way the burgers get made. But you still know when you go into a McDonald's whether that's run by someone who knows what they're doing. You can see the difference in whether the bathrooms are clean, the whether the people have they're a nice. smile, when, whether they're nice. It's the hospitality issue we were talking about before. It's the operator. You know, mm -hmm. it's the, the same thing. We're taking it to hospitality. Two hotels. Same franchise, two different operators, two completely different experiences because of the people who are running it. That's mm -hmm. so when you're thinking of hiring, a, you want to know who is it that I'm working with, who's who's my partner in helping me build my business. Do I like that person? Do I trust that person? Do I think that person work for me? Because they're going to be working with that person, not the 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 guy who runs that franchise or the person whose name is on the door. Mm -hmm. Even in a company like mine, I mean, you know, people should join my company. They're not going to have a day-to-day -day experience with me. I run stuff and I'm very involved and I like to think I'm a good operator, but they need to have a good experience with that manager. We mm -hmm. have full-time non-competing non, non managers who work in the office. Which That's who huge. the day-to-day -day experience is going to be. That's who they're going to work with right. on a day-to-day -day basis. I never turn down, a, you know, they email me, they're getting an answer. They text me, they're getting an answer. They can get day-to-day -day experience with me, but I'm not going to be involved you know, every day with their business the way their manager is. So right. it's the manager or the broker owner if it's a company that's, you know, smaller. That's who you have to really focus on. Right. Joe, thanks so much. We've run out of time, but people can tweet you with questions if they... Sure, absolutely. Questions. At Joseph Rand or find me at facebook.com slash Joseph Rand, awesome. anything like that. You can just Google me and you'll find a million, a million ways to find me. And those shots from law school. And the, uh, there'll, there'll be all sorts of things, yes, yes. The, the, some things I, I've been managing to suppress. You know. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in to Sam Speaks. Again, you can, say, you can download Sam Speaks Radio on iTunes and make sure to check us out every single week.